démarrer. On va démarrer dans, dans 5 minutes. On avait juste, on voulait vous dire, on remercie d'être là déjà. Donc à la base, je ne sais pas si tout le monde a vu qu'il y avait une conférence donc, de Richard et de Paul qui, qui sont de passage à Paris. Donc on a eu la chance de les accueillir. Au début, ce n'était pas prévu, c'était juste un apéro. Mais on a la chance de, de les avoir. Donc euh, voilà, c'est pour ça que la salle est un peu petite. Mais bon, on va arriver à rentrer, je pense. Euh, à part ça, donc, euh, on voulait, en, le POC voulait remercier donc, Upwork qui sponsorise la soirée. Euh, je vais laisser Vincent euh, présenter rapidement Upwork, qui est euh, donc, sponsor de, de l'apéro et qui prendra les bières euh, qui sont en route. Ah, ouais. <rire> ah, voilà, donc, euh, merci. Euh, donc Upwork, pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas, c'est euh, Just Startup. Euh, on s'est lancé en bêta il y a six mois, on est lancé euh, sur le marché il y a un mois et demi. Et on est une plateforme de mise en relation de freelance, du coup développeurs, à 50%, avec des entreprises, donc en direct, qui sont passées par les États-Unis, les intermédiaires. Donc je ne vais pas faire une longue présentation. Ceux qui veulent en savoir plus, vous venez me voir à la fin, vous venez voir Emmanuel, c'est elle qui euh, servira les bières. Euh, juste aussi, je voulais remercier l'espace qui nous accueille aujourd'hui, qui s'appelle Remix Coworking, le showroom. Donc c'est un espace de coworking où interviennent euh, des freelances, des startups. Euh, D'ailleurs, petit point technique, le wifi c'est remix coworking et le mot de passe c'est comment est votre blanquette enfin, Ceux qui ont vu le 1617, euh, trop long. Euh, voilà, donc euh, nous on est ravis, on fait souvent ce type d'événement. Euh, vous pouvez nous suivre sur notre Twitter at euh, Upwork, euh, ou, ou pardon, vous restez sur Upwork et aussi vous recevrez nos newsletters. On va faire ça vraiment de plus en plus souvent. Euh, si on peut en faire de plus en plus souvent aussi avec le Paris Android User Group, ce sera vraiment bien. Donc euh, bah, merci d'être présent et puis après on va, je, je te relais la, la parole pour présenter nos amis de Google. Alors. Oui, donc pour euh, ceux qui ne euh, connaîtraient pas, donc Richard et Chris sont deux développeurs advocates Android de chez Google, donc, euh, qui sont basés à Londres normalement, mais qui sont en passage à Paris, euh, et qui vont nous parler donc, de, des nouveautés de Jellybean 4.3 et aussi des nouveautés de la Google Support. Donc euh, voilà, donc, je vais les laisser commencer et puis euh, j'espère que ça va vous plaire. Is that go? Yeah. Is it going in French? Thank you. <laughs> Hello, bonjour, Porg. It's good to see you again. It's been a long time since I've been at a Porg meeting, probably over a year now. Jesus, sorry about that. Um, but we were late organizing it because we weren't quite sure the final release date of 4.3, and we didn't want to say we'd come if 4.3 wasn't out. But we just happened to be here, and 4.3 is out. So thank you very much for letting us gate crash your apéro. Apéro? Yeah. And uh, hopefully we can have some beers later on and <laughs> catch up. So I'm just going to give you a quick, probably half an hour, on some of the new features in Android 4.3. We have... Uh, <laughs> 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 I'll do it in a minute. It's okay. Uh, yeah, we have a couple of the new tablets with us, the new Nexus 7, so we'll pass them around when we get to that slide in the presentation. So Android 4.3. We've got three of these little things, collectibles, to give out today. So the first one, for anybody who can tell me what the new, the API docs for 4.3 describe this release as. Alexis. Other than Alexis. Uh, it was in Rito's This Week in Android Development today, and I put it on G Plus earlier. So if you go to the API doc for Jelly Bean MR2, API level 18, it says. Yeah, yeah, who says that? Who? Yeah? No, dude, you can't have it. You're filming this. Damn it. <laughs> Are you going to get all three? <laughs> I'll throw it to the person next to you and then. Yeah? There you go. I'm not throwing it at the camera because that's just dangerous. Okay, so Android Jelly Bean, the revenge of the beans. Following on from more Jelly Beans and just Jelly Bean. I don't know why they put that in there, but we'll kick it off because the first device with this is the new Nexus 7. Uh, not out in Europe yet, but hopefully coming soon. We have a couple that we can pass around. Uh, thinner, lighter, higher resolution screen. It's 1900 by 1200 full HD. Better battery life. Uh, Qi charging, FC. I said thinner and lighter, smaller bezels. Uh, many other things as well. So you can pass that around and have a look at it if you want. I quite like it. Um, Is it also a phone? It's not also a phone, no. We do have an LTE version as well, but you can't make phone calls on it. It's just for data. It comes in 16 gig, 32 gig, and 32 gig plus LTE. And stereo speakers, which is quite nice. Uh, we didn't have that on the previous Nexus 7, and also Dolby 5.1 virtualization. 
So tons and tons of new stuff at a very similar price point to the old one. Faster CPU, faster GPU, and uh, all the goodies. So looking at it, let's say it's got this seven inch display. Uh, if you want to design for it, very easily, it's exactly the same number of dips as the previous Nexus 7. They're both 960 by 600 density independent pixels. This one's running XHDPI instead of HDPI, so it's going to grab your assets from your XHDPI builds, things like your Nexus 4 build. It'll take the assets from there and the layouts from your Nexus 7 builds, and you'll end up with something that looks amazing on here without making any changes, hopefully. Am I speaking OK speed? You can understand what I'm saying? Enough nods. Either that, you can just look at the slides, and I'll get out of here more quickly. Um, yeah, and it's the launch device for Android 4.3 which we announced last week. So let's have a quick look at Android 4.3, which looks exceedingly green on this screen. I don't know why. The uh, contrast is turned right up. We have Bluetooth LE, finally. So uh, Chris has got his Fitbit connected to his tablet with an early version of the Fitbit software. I've got a heart rate monitor, which I was going to be wearing, but I forgot. So one of you could tell me my heart rate. Um, but finally, we have all these Bluetooth LE accessories now available to Android. And we'll run through the API for that very soon uh, in a couple of slides. But it's a very simple API. It's a lot more robust than just Bluetooth. I love Bluetooth smart stuff. It comes with AVRCP 1.3, which is that um, remote control protocol for connecting to your car stereo. And it also supports the media uh, tags as well now. So you'll be able to see your album art inside your car stereo and listings and properly control the devices if you have 4.3. OpenGL uh, GLES 3.0. Uh, problems with OpenGL 2 were all the different texture compression formats was one of the biggest fall aches for game developers. So now as we're moving to OpenGL 3, it's got a new texture compression format to, to rule them all. So hopefully all games, as we move on, we'll be able to just have ETC2 slash EAC uh, textures in them. There's a, a bunch of other stuff in there. And we have an OpenGL slide in a minute, so I can get to that. Uh, media codecs, we finally have muxing of two media streams, an audio and a video stream, into an MP4 file. Uh, and alongside that, we have now allow you to record, uh, encode a video straight off a surface. So if you have a game that's running OpenGL, you can pass the surface straight into the media encoder and also make a video of the surface at the same time as you're playing it. Thank you. And then output that as MP4. So it's, uh, it's only a few lines of code if for some reason, uh, I think it's a big thing these days, gamers recording their gameplay and then uploading it to YouTube. You can now do that inside Android 4.3. Unfortunately, that's not backwards compatible, but it's there now. Restricted profiles we'll run through in a minute. A UI automation framework is for building testing tools on top of. So it's quite low level. It's aimed at people who build test frameworks and test tools. Um, but uh, improve language support, again, we always improve language support until they're all in there. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how close we are now, but there's better right to left support again. And a whole load of more butter. The whole thing's smoother. Uh, Roman and Chet, again, have been ripping the entire framework apart, trying to find ways of improving the speed and latency. The, for the devices that support OpenGL 3, the 2D and 3D rendering of the launcher and things are now using the OpenGL 3 pipeline for better acceleration. Running through it very quickly. All right, the OpenGL ES3 stuff, as I just mentioned, uh, is supported on the, the new 7 and the 4 and the 10 at the moment. Uh, Unity already supports it, so games which uh, are outputting through Unity can recompile and support OpenGL ES3 uh, functions already and use all the new textures, things like that. If you're using it, the OpenGL ES3 stuff is totally backwards compatible. The context is backwards compatible with the GLS2 context. So when you just ask for an OpenGL context, and then you can find out what version it's given you. And if it's given you a version 3 context, you can use the new functionality. If it's given you a version 2 context, use the older stuff. That's come out a bit ropey on here, hasn't it? I took the screenshot. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, and the rest of the notes have gone off the bottom of the screen. All right. Restricted Profiles is probably going to be, alongside BTLE, the most used of the Android 4.3 APIs. Uh, before, when we were using uh, multiple user profiles in previous versions of Jelly Bean, if you wanted to share it with a kid, uh, you would set up a profile for them. You would then try and restrict it somehow. You'd probably put a pin on the Play Store, install some applications for them, turn off synchronization because they'd be using your Gmail account, and just generally a bit of a pain in the ass. So now we have restricted profiles. You go in, you create a restricted profile for this user, and they don't get access to the Play Store. They can't bill things to your account. They can't read your Gmail. They don't get access to it. And you can control exactly which applications they get access to. Uh, yeah, so we had multiple users, and now we have these restricted profiles. When you go into users, you just add a new user and add a restricted profile, and uh, it's as easy as that. Alongside that come settings, 
where you can specify exactly which applications uh, they get and the details of each of those applications, like whether you want the child to have location access or the application to have access to the child's location. Uh, if you want to add it inside your application, there's just a, a line inside the manifest that you put in. Here, you want your uh, broadcast receiver for get restriction entries. And adding this into the manifest will add a little settings button next to your application in the user control flow. And then you get the settings button. And when you press on that button, it's going to fill with all the different restrictions you've specified for your application. In this case, maybe you don't want the child to be able to see which uh, items of contact are locked or change the uh, language of the application. Personally, oh, I'll do that in a second. Uh, so you've said that you have uh, settings, restriction settings. Now, the user's gone and pressed the settings button, and now you want the application to populate the settings. So it's going to fire off uh, the broadcast. What was it? It's going to fire off that broadcast from the previous slide, get restriction entries broadcast. It's going to come into your broadcast receiver here. When it comes into the broadcast receiver, you're going to call go async, which is a method on broadcast receivers. It just keeps the broadcast receiver alive and gives you a pending result object so you can send results back to it. So you call go async inside your on receive, the broadcast, and then you send it back inside this pending result. You send it back an array list of restriction entries. And each one of these restriction entries uh, is keyed on a string so you can pull back the results later on. And uh, it just has a description in it and the restriction itself. Uh, so each one of these that you see here is a restriction entry and each one has a key. So we have three different types of restrictions. We have the Boolean type, which is just a tick yes or no. We have a single choice from a list type, which looks like this. Uh, could be good for age rating, things like that, if you want to say that uh, the child using this account is 13 plus 15, 17, whatever, and then you can restrict the content inside your, maybe your media application to only show content relevant to that child. And we also have multiple choice types as well. So you can enable and disable multiple types of functionality inside your application. And in code, a restriction entry looks like this. So you have a new restriction entry. Uh, we have three different constructors for it for the three different types of restriction entries, the single choice, multi multiple choice, and Boolean. And you just set the type and set the title. And this is your key at the top here in the constructor, which is you'll get the setting back and fire. So you can find out what the, uh, the owner of the device has set the restriction to. The other types, very similar thing. This is for the single entry type. Again, you have a default. Uh, put in age level in there. These slides are available in Rito's talk this morning, actually. Uh, so now you've told the platform that you have restrictions. The platform's asked you for them, and you've returned them back again. So now the adult's going to go and select, choose those restrictions, and then launch the application. So you need to retrieve the settings that have been set inside the application. To retrieve the settings, on your on resume, you can just call uh, get application restrictions from the user service, uh, from the user manager, sorry. And then inside there, you'll get a bundle back with all the restrictions that have been set on your application. That should be pretty simple. And then uh, you could be, if you have a content-based application especially, it's uh, very advisable to implement this stuff. Also, if you have in-app purchases inside your application, uh, it can be quite nice just to strip them out when you're inside a restricted profile. So the parent gets access to the purchases and they buy things for the child. And when the child goes in, they just see the collection of content that's been purchased for them. Uh, because if they try and, if you leave the in-app payments in there, the child won't be able to complete them because they don't get access. There's one other thing as well. If you don't want to go through all of this and you'd rather manage the restrictions inside your own application, then we have custom restrictions as well. So instead of when the system asks you for your restrictions, instead of sending back an array list of restriction entries, you can send back an intent which fires your own custom restriction screen. So when it asks you inside your broadcast receiver, instead you can fire back an intent of restriction, uh, extra restrictions intent, and then a class inside your own APK, which you want that settings button to fire up so that you can maintain all your restrictions in one handy place. A bit like we do for uh, batteries and data and things like that. You can go straight from the settings screen, deep link into your application, and then it can be managed in your own user interface. So that's all there is for restrictions. Uh, hopefully, it will be used quite a lot. We have a few applications on the store already starting to use it. Uh, kids storybooks, media content applications, things like that. Uh, in some countries, these things are mandatory anyway. 
So it's quite handy to be able to do it from a system level. Bluetooth LE also came along into Android 4.3, uh, certainly on the, the 4710 series of devices. Uh, I've got a heart rate monitor in here. As I say, I just picked up a Bluetooth LE heart rate monitor off uh, Amazon and connected it straight away with Runtastic, and that's working fine. Apps like Endomondo will be coming along soon as well to support uh, Bluetooth LE devices, and Fitbit as well is updating soon to support Bluetooth LE. All the Bluetooth LE support is through APIs. It's not just, you don't just go to the Bluetooth setting screen and connect like a heart rate monitor. Uh, we have an API flow for it. Uh, so if you want to connect, for example, uh, that is a heart rate monitor to your application on your Nexus 4, first of all, you have to check if Bluetooth is on. If not, you're going to get that nasty uh, uh, force close dialog, and that's easy enough. You just check, you get the system service for Bluetooth and just check that the adapter is not null. This has actually changed. Previously for Bluetooth, you would call get default adapter, but now there's multiple adapters, so you just you call get adapter on the manager and you'll get this back. And if it's not null, then it's going to support Bluetooth. Check that it's on. Of course, you, have, uh, you can't just turn Bluetooth on yourself. You either have to tell the user that you're turning Bluetooth on or ask the system to do it. So you can just fire off an intent to request Bluetooth enabled, if it's not already enabled. Simple stuff. Same as just using normal Bluetooth. And then you get into the Bluetooth low energy flow. So Bluetooth low energy devices always start off in standby, the device does, and you call a low energy scan, and that'll start scanning for any low energy devices in the room. You'll get a callback giving you the details of each of the low energy devices that it's found. Then you're going to want to connect to the chosen device, whether it's a heart rate monitor. Uh, once you've connected to it, you can discover the services that it's offering up. One of them for a heart rate monitor will be heart rate. That's a good service. One of them would be location and battery life, other services that it may be necessary. Uh, and then you can say, yeah, I want to register for updates to the heart rate characteristic. And then you go into this loop where it's active and it's just constantly sending you updates every second or whatever for the heart rate. So it's quite simple. It's much more simple than connecting and uh, controlling a Bluetooth device. And so far it's been very robust. I've been running these things for hours and hours on end. Uh, battery life of Bluetooth LE devices obviously is a... Uh, much extended. You can get like a year out of a single coin cell for a heart rate monitor. Uh, in code, <laughs> it's very similar to the callbacks. I based the entire diagram on the code. So you call start LE scan <coughs> and you'll get your callback. In the callback, it just comes to here. The RSSI thing is the only thing there that's not so obvious and that's the signal strength of the LE device. But other than that, it's going to ping this every time it finds a device. And then you're just going to say you want to connect to it. The false there is for auto-connect. If you set yes there, then you can auto-connect to it from then on. You set true. And then this is going to come back with the callback. Actually, at this point, um, some Bluetooth devices uh, you don't need to connect to. They always just advertise. There is an advertising mode for Bluetooth LE. And um, when it's saying, I'm here, like a, a heart rate monitor, when, uh, will, when it's connected, be broadcasting the fact that it's a heart rate monitor ready for someone to pick it up. Uh, some small sensors and things like that will send all the information you need in that broadcast. And it's called advertising mode. So actually, before this stage, you could just read that advertising data all the time. If it's, um, I'm trying to think of some good examples. Uh, proximity key rings, things like that. I think they just sit there broadcasting the whole time. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. You don't need to go and connect to them and find out. It's just, yeah. So maybe even the stage before this, you finished if it's like a proximity um, key ring detector thingy. If not, you connect to it anyway, and you'll get the set of callbacks. Uh, we have a nice sample which runs through all of these for you and uh, shows you connection to a heart rate monitor. It's pretty simple. Then you read the attributes. Uh, this is just saying I want notifications for the characteristic. The characteristic is just a UUID of, say, the heart rate characteristic. You send that back to the device and it'll start broadcasting to you. One thing in the current version, uh, we don't have peripheral mode on the phone. Uh, so it can only connect two peripherals. It can't pretend to be a peripheral. So you can't have two Android devices talking to each other at the moment over Bluetooth LE in this version of the release. Uh, it gets confusing because we do support server mode. So Bluetooth has client and server and peripheral. And yeah. Um, so server. the difference is that uh, server mode can, re can write settings on other devices. So you may have a device which connects to you, but you're still the server. And then you write settings onto that device. But that's very different to per being a peripheral and peripheral mode where something else comes and connects to you and then you interact with it. 
So uh, we've had that question quite a lot of times. How come you have server mode, but I can't talk between two devices? It's because we don't have peripheral mode. But it should come. I'd imagine so. Uh, next one, quickly, was just AVRCP 1.3 I mentioned before. You now get much better metadata and pictures and stuff when you connect either Bluetooth to a Bluetooth speaker or car stereo, whatever it is. Uh, it uses the standard remote control client APIs. So if you're already using remote control client for lock screen controls, notification controls, things like that, you, it will automatically start working for you if you're already pushing your metadata to that. If not, it's just a simple API. Just make sure you call clear before you go and push data, else you might put your bitmap on top of someone else's uh, text or something, track names. All right, it's getting very warm in here. Uh, quick update on debugging. There's one extra feature. Previously, we had showing GPU overdraw, which was fantastic for just seeing how many levels of overdraw you had. You could see which parts of your screen you needed to minimize and optimize. Here, I had like three times overdraw on the entire clock, and that's because I'd left a white background paint on the view pager and a white background paint on the clock, and then just things that didn't need to be there, they were getting overdrawn, overdrawn, overdrawn. So I took away a few of the background colors, and it ended up redrawing the screen twice less and improving the draw times by about double. So this is very useful, and this has been in for since 4.0. But now we also have GPU rendering profiled on the screen as well. And GPU pro rendering uh, is going to draw these little lines for every single um, activity on the display. So you have a little one on the action bar, one up here, and one for your activity here. And the magic bar is the little green bar, uh, which is about taking each one of these is how long it's taken to draw the last frame. And this is 15 milliseconds. So if you go over here, you're not going to hit that 60 frames a second that you want to get, which is V-synced. So if you miss here, you're going to miss the V-sync <laughs> of the display. I think just get a bit janky and horrible. So with this, as you're playing through your application, you can see when it spikes over here and when you get the jank on, again, where you need to fix it. So it's not just showing the display, it's showing uh, interactively where it all goes horribly wrong. Okay. So we have the update of the display list, the processing, and then the actual drawing to the screen as three separate parts in the chart. So if you've got really good eyes, you can see the different sections in those tiny little graphs and figure out where all the time is being spent and de-jank your apps. And as per always, you can go to Android Device Monitor to get more details on Hyper-P Viewer, Tracer for OpenGL, and other things, but it's worth pointing out. It's an Android SDK tools monitor, and that's been in for a while as well. Before everybody expires, Google Play Games. <laughs> updated as well last week. Uh, we had Google Play Games already with achievements, leaderboards, cloud safe, and real-time multiplayer. But with the 4.3 launch, uh, we also launched the destination application for Google Play Games. So now you have this little icon on your desktop in your phone. Uh, you can go into it. You can see what your friends on Google Plus are playing. I can click on Ade, for example, and find out that he's playing 7x7 and Uno. And if I want from there, I can tap Uno and actually install it directly from inside this application. So if you're implementing Google Play game services inside your app, you will automatically appear in this app, and it will drive more downloads for you. If lots of friends start playing it together, it becomes viral, and it just provides another discovery. And, uh, <laughs> and way of installation for your application. OK, and the final slide is I just snuck out there. How did I not get rid of those? Damn it. What was the thing? <laughs> uh, so we've got two of these there. Who's playing a game right now that uses Google Play Games? Uh, which game are you playing? You said first. Which game are you playing? Okay. Oh, damn it. Go on, what game are you playing? <laughs> which is a good I'm playing uh, like Samurai vs. Zombies. Samurai vs. Zombies. Is that a real game? Samurai. Yeah. It's like a glue game. It's like a glue game called Samurai vs. Zombies. Which features of Google Play Games does it use? Achievements uh, and leaderboards. Oh, God. <laughs> and Kristen, give that one out in a minute. All right, uh, and the other thing was, uh, we are hiring in the Android Developer Relations team at the moment. We're looking for someone to support Play Games <laughs> across Europe. But NDK, uh, Native Development Kit, uh, media stuff, low-level APIs, Play Games, that sort of thing, uh, for partners and developers and doing outreach across Europe for hardcore Android topics. So OpenGL, 3D as well, that sort of thing. And it would be beneficial if they spoke French, because we have no French skills in our team at all. And we already have randomly some other languages covered. So if you know anyone or you are somebody who's very interested in working from London, unfortunately, that's where the studio is, uh, but supporting Android developers across the whole of Europe, Middle East, and Russia, and Israel with um, their low-level gaming stuff, then uh, let me know. Thank you very much. That's all. Q&A. Anything? Just <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I'm warm. And we've lost two Nexus 7s. Wow. Any more questions? Does anyone have any questions while Chris is setting up? Do you want to click here? Uh, yeah. Three times down. I just dropped them as well. Feel free to give away um, an Android collectible. <laughs>